Hello, and welcome to AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. I'm your host, John S. Today we'll be speaking with Weston W. from Indianapolis, Indiana. In this episode, Weston shares his experience, strength, and hope as an atheist in AA. We'll also talk about his views of the 12 steps and sponsorship, and much, much more. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, hello, Weston. Uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate this. Yeah, absolutely. Been uh, been excited about the opportunity. Like a like a good AA. I've been you know like in my head thinking about what I'm going to talk about. Of course, you know. Sure. <laughs> so, how did you uh, you you found us um, online? So, were, have you been uh, visiting AA Agnostica for a while? Are you very familiar with the site and so forth? Yeah, yeah. I've been vi- I've been visiting for about two two and a half years. Um, okay. Yeah, because uh, my sobriety day is July eighth, twenty thirteen. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, ever ever since I I came into the program, you know, um, I I am you know self self proclaimed atheist, and you know, yeah. Um, it, it was it was a tough tough go from the beginning, and thankfully, yeah, um, kind of fell into to the website when I was doing like a, a Google search. Well, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. Um, I I think you know. The, the odds were already stacked against me. Um, my my dad would be more than fine with me sharing that he's been in the program for 28 years. Cool. Um, you know, my mom probably qualifies for the program, but you know, has chosen a different a different path. So genetically, it's all up and down, both sides of my family, addiction, just in general. And uh, I I had always had it in my mind, you know, like I can't I can't drink. You know, one drop of alcohol is going to turn me into an alcoholic. Was like the joke that I. Had through high school, mm-hmm. and as high school kind of started wrapping down, I, I was done with sports. Just kind of, you know, just kind of picked it up. Just was just drinking and partying and, and, and experimenting a lot of ways that I, I hadn't um, because I was trying to get good grades, stay active in sports, and um, I, I think pretty quickly I realized that I was doing it differently than other people around me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I. I feel like I, I I would carry like guilt and like shame and remorse uh, yeah. around and, and I didn't see that in other people and I didn't see, you know, everyone getting blackout drunk every single time. Right. And I was a blackout drunk from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, how our stories go, it just, you know, proceeded to just kind of, um, just kind of get worse over time. Um, you know, I, I know this, this is an AA, you know, program, mm-hmm. and, um, but drugs are definitely a part of the story. Uh, oh yeah. You know, a, a lot more illicit drug use prior to college, um, mm-hmm. you know, cause by the time I, um, ended up going back to school, um, it was just way more socially acceptable to just drink. Yeah. And, uh, so I just kind of, you know, it was like a chameleon, you know, it, it's so easy to just blend in at college. You, yeah. you just surround yourself with, with some normies that are just, you know, like amateur hour and it, you know, you have no problem just blending in. Yeah. Well, that's quite similar to, to my story. Um, yeah, I, I, I grew up in the seventies and, uh, so drugs, you know, marijuana in particular was pretty prevalent, but, uh, my parents were just happy. They were okay with us drinking as long as we didn't do drugs. Um, but it turns out that alcohol is a drug too, <laughs> and it's Shock. it's uh, probably just as deadly as any other, if not more so. Right. Um, yeah. There's there's not a whole lot of them that you black out and do really really stupid things on. It's kind of funny. I actually would have been we would have been better off as kids uh, smoking dope than we would have been <laughs> drinking uh, vodka and crap and driving around. Right. But anyway. Yeah. That was the, that was the attitude back then, and and then I went to college, and you know I already. I, I, my drinking is already out of control. And then in college, it just got, it's got, it got even worse. And I, and I, I can relate with the remorse too. I think I almost always experienced that, uh, went along with the drinking. Yeah. And it was probably, you know, maybe a year into, into, um, my third attempt at college, I eventually graduated from Ball State, uh, mm-hmm. there in, in Indiana, um, in 2007. So maybe like by about, 
would have been probably 2003, 2004 is when I started like thinking about how I needed to try and control my drinking. Yeah. You know, that was when I would say, well, I'm going to put it down for a month or I'm going to put it down forever. And you know how that goes. It was right. <laughs> by Friday, you know, I've bounced back from the prior weekend and, you know, I have, I've come to understand now about the idea of changing people, places, and things, you know, changing mm-hmm. ideas. I wasn't doing any of that stuff, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just trying to kind of willpower it, and, and unfortunately, that didn't get very far. So, what got you to go to your first meeting? Um, it was it was probably it was right around that same time, maybe my second year um, off campus there at, at Ball State. I, um, I I started doing some kind of online research. And one of the biggest issues, of course, was reading 12 steps and seeing Mm -hmm. one particular word that kind of stood out like a neon flash, you know, like, God, (laughs) yeah, there's like sparklers around it. And, you know, it just like zooms me in. And that is interesting to hear because, of course, I'm obviously I I predate the the Internet. (laughs) And so uh, there was no Internet when I when I when I was trying to find out about AA. And I think that um, with millennials now, the very first place they're going to go before they before they even go to a damn AA meeting, they're going to go to the Internet. They're going to read about AA. Uh And so that's what you did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and then I looked I looked up a meeting because I was like. Well, maybe I'll just go check it out. And, you know, I went and it confirmed all my biases. You know, it was, yeah. it was a bunch of old, white, you know, divorced males, you know, that, you know, uh, didn't look like they're very friendly. But that was all my interpretation, of course. Mm. I'm sure if I could somehow replay that, it was probably actually just like most meetings where they were actually happy to see each other and, <laughs> and upbeat. But I was the one coming in miserable. Um, I don't remember really anything about that first meeting. Um, I, I don't think it, I don't know if I even, you know, um, said my name. I'm right. sure I didn't say I was an alcoholic. Yeah. Because I was still playing that semantics game of, well, I'm really a binge drinker. I, I, I'm a problem drinker. I, right. You know, those games that we play. Yeah. I didn't know what I was at my first meeting and I. I didn't say anything at my first meeting either, and I, I I sensed that nobody was expecting me to say anything because I I was just I was just such a mess. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I did feel pretty welcomed at that meeting. I mean, I I really did get the sense that people were people did care about me and that they understood where I was coming from. Yeah, I didn't share anything. I I'm pretty sure I didn't share anything. Now. Around here, every single meeting closes the Lord's Prayer, and that's what they did at my first meeting. Um, do they do that where you're from? Yes, yes. Uh, like, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy with, you know, there's not too much of my anonymity I'm afraid of giving away. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've lived in Indiana, in central mm-hmm. Indiana, in a suburb, yeah. suburb of Indianapolis. So, okay. you know, kind of cuss on the cusp of the Bible Belt type stuff. And uh, Right, you're in Dr. Bob country. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, they're, every meeting except for the two... Um, we agnostic meetings that we have all all end in, in the Lord's Prayer. So, do you go to the we agnostics meetings in um, Indianapolis? Yeah, or? yeah. I consider I mean, there's two. There's one on a Thursday and then one on a Sunday, and that's the only two in the Indianapolis metro area currently. Um, I consider the Thursday my my home group, but it's it's a little mm-hmm. tough to get to sometimes with my work schedule. Um, yeah. But yeah, that it's um, it's it's awesome to have that opportunity when I know that there's so many out there that don't. Yeah. So how long, how long were you going to meetings before you learned about that? Um, well, I mean, to, to, to back, back up a little bit after that, mm-hmm. that first meeting, it was probably eight, eight or nine years before I tried anything else again. Gotcha. Um, okay. I graduated from college and went out to Arizona for a year do a term of service with public ally or with AmeriCorps. It's not mm-hmm. like the domestic peace corps. And mm-hmm. I went out there and I was thinking, Oh, you know, they, they live better out in Arizona. They're cleaner and healthier. Like, you know, that'll help cut down on my drinking, you know, mm-hmm. that first kind of big geographical change that I, I thought would, would put an end to things. And I remember struggling majorly out there, major bout of depression. Um, I, I know I called a suicide hotline at least once. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I went to try and talk to somebody about maybe doing like a PHP or an inpatient program or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think he, he 
he mentioned something about God, you know, with, with mm-hmm. this, the 12 step stuff was in front of me. And it was the first time I heard somebody say, well, it's a higher power, really make it anything you want. But mm-hmm. I wasn't ready to hear that. It, it right. It wasn't, it was still like, okay, I'm smarter than you guys. You know, I know you're just playing these word games. You're just this is semantics. You're still talking. Right. To God, you know, knock it off. Um, <laughs> So then it was just, you know, a few more years of pain. Um, the alcohol started creating terrible anxiety. So still started having like real bad panic attacks, um, real bad anxiety. So I got put on Klonopin, which is like a okay. so sedative type thing. And, you know, I just started abusing those real bad and drinking on top of them. And, mm-hmm. you know, all my friends and family used to say, you know, you're a real jerk when you're drinking real real jerk but when you're drinking on top of those you it's an entirely different level of darkness wow you know it's like we don't even recognize you as a human being when you're you know wow you're you're mixing those two um so you know going at it pretty hard with those and um you know I'll, I'll, i'll touch on my bottom a little bit um it's it was uh it started probably about April 2013, May 2013, I mm-hmm. uh, was in a, in a friend's wedding and swallowed some of those pills and went and got a fifth. I was like, oh, it's a wedding, you know, people drink and party and, and stuff like that. And I ended up getting blackout drunk, um, embarrassed myself. I disappeared during the pictures and, you know, he just sent me a letter saying, you know, like, hey, man, I, you're, you seem to be in a lot of pain. You need some help. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So there was there was lots of people that noticed it before me for sure. Yeah, that seems to be the way it is for us. So it was certainly was for me. And was is that what finally got you to get to that meeting? Well, uh, it was it was close. There was you know maybe I think I might have dried out for a little bit and then um, you know didn't do anything. Picked everything back up. Probably not too much longer after that. Got in mm-hmm. a car accident where I curbed my car. Woke up face down. Uh, on my mom's couch, not knowing anything about really the prior 24 hours. It was the first time somebody said out loud, my stepdad was there. And it was the first time someone out loud said, you should probably get some help for this. Mm -hmm. Um, I I went home. My wife had actually kicked me out on that Friday. So I was out all Friday night, Saturday, woke up Sunday morning, face down to my mom's, like I said. And uh, it was the first, I went home and she was shocked to see me. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I told you to leave and I told her, I said out loud for the first time, I think I need help. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it on my own. Yeah. And so I remember saying those words <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of like one of those flashball moments in, in my yeah. life. And she went right to the computer and, and started, uh, searching treatment centers. And I am extremely grateful and lucky for the fact that we have a top-notch treatment center here in Indianapolis, mm-hmm. it's called Fairbanks, and it's 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 just it's it's renowned throughout the state. You know, it's it's thank okay. it's real close to us. It was like uh, it's like a twenty-minute drive from from where mm-hmm. I live, and went went into treatment and wasn't I wasn't really coherent for the first two days. Probably um, they thought maybe I tried a suicide attempt because I swallowed. Mm-hmm. You because I was, I'm a good addict, and they said they right. like, why'd you do that? I'm like, well, because you were gonna throw it away, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, while I was there, it was, it was the first time that I, I started listening. You mm-hmm. know, I had always just been a big talker, uh, which you might notice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I can get kind of carried away sometimes, and you know, just I, I started listening, and that's where things yeah. really started changing. So what type of, um, did they, did they do like the 12 step model at that treatment center? Yeah. Uh-huh. They, they, yep. They are a, uh, they, they are, they, are, they teach the 12 step model. You know, of course don't say anything. Uh-huh. it's not officially AA sponsored or anything. Right. Because, you know, you can't have that kind of stuff going on. But that's what most treatment centers do, I think, is they probably, they probably encourage AA and all that kind of thing. Right. Right. You know, they, they teach a 12 step model, but you know, they, they'll, they'll often say, but there's other ways of doing it. This is right. just the one way that we teach that seems to have helped a lot of people. Yeah. You 
know, they don't really touch too much on smart recovery. They don't really touch mm-hmm. too much on like celebrate recovery. I don't know if they have CR out there. I haven't even heard of that. No. Celebrate recovery. Yeah. It's, it's just like a, it's like Jesus, me, the 12 steps are going to get me sober basically. Oh, it's a Christian. It's a Christian based oh, thing. Yeah. 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 Super, oh, super okay. Christian. Yeah. And that's at, okay. at churches and it's, is that kind of popular where you are? Um, I mean, it, it exists. I, yeah. I, there's a few few of them, so it, it, yeah. they're pretty pretty um, well attended, the few that there are. Well, I guess I was, I was asking about that because I was wondering, how did they, I mean, did you let them know you were an atheist when you were in treatment, and how did they approach that if you did? Um, it, it definitely would come up, like they would have alumni panels, you know, people that were former patients that would come in and speak. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them would start touching on the, the problem that they had with the God thing when they, when they came in. Yeah. So that kind of gave me some hope. And I remember vividly actually opened up the big book and, you know, amazingly enough started reading it, which is shocking, mm-hmm. you know, to think that someone in treatment would actually open the book and read it. Yeah. And I remember getting to we agnostics and just like falling apart. Um, yeah, I'm like bawling my eyes out, I'm throwing the book across the room, I'm <laughs> yelling at it, you know, and there was, it was a part of me that was like, I, I can't do this. Right. I, I, I just, I don't see how I'm going to be able to do it. They got to take that chapter out. That chapter is basically saying that it's not going to, we have to change our belief system. Right, right. It's so condescending and it's just, well, but what that led me to to get where it, where it took me was there was this there's this old grizzled Vietnam vet that was in there that you could tell he had been in and out of treatment for probably the last 40 years mm-hmm. real real well versed in, in AA and mm-hmm. for the first time I heard the idea of take what works and leave the rest yeah like and that just it, that changed everything for me literally everything yeah. when he said that I was like yeah that makes a lot of sense let me mm-hmm. let me start finding things in here that will work for me, rather, there you go. right? Rather than taking and just throwing it all away and thinking nothing uh, nothing will work for me, rather than switching that around, and that that was crucial. That changed everything for me. Um, that and there was a there was a um, an employee there. Um, she was a they were called techs. Um, it's kind of like a nurse, kind of like a counselor slash type thing. And she said, hey, I'm 20 years sober and I'm an atheist. Oh. And that was the first time in person I experienced that. Yeah. And, that was good of her to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, she she saw how bad I was struggling. Uh, yeah. And, and said, hey, you know, here's here's the meetings. Um, circled the we agnostics, uh, wrote down a name and said, hey, ask for this guy. And uh um, that was that was really crucial for me. Well, very cool. That is very. You are fortunate that you had that agnostic, had two agnostic meetings in your area. Um, that's great. I, you know, I, I didn't have that. I didn't even know about it, such a thing until a few years ago. And so I spent decades in AA, you know, uh, just trying to do it by the book. I went to a group that was really a by the book, you know, type of a group. So um, that would have been nice to have that option. I don't, I don't know if I would have chosen it or not, though. I, I don't know back then, but yeah. I don't know what I was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've been I've been pretty much an ardent, pretty ardent atheist since I was probably about twenty one. Um, mm-hmm. I was pretty much just leaned agnostic prior probably the prior five ten years. Um, yeah, took a class called mythologies course and was like, oh, wait a minute. Like all of these stories are the same and they yeah. repeat since the beginning of human history when we started writing stories down. It, yeah. yeah. It's funny. I, I, um, I was, I, I, I didn't grow up in a religious family. I knew absolutely nothing about religion. And I always thought that my problem was I didn't know how to believe in God that I, you know, I didn't know enough or whatever. And I tried to believe and I, I actually read the Bible and I took a class about, um, the new Testament as literature. And it's funny when you really read the new Testament as literature, it's really interesting because you learn how they get all those books together. And then you, then you kind of realize, Oh no, this is, th- these are people that put this thing together, you know? It's, so yeah, it's, it's interesting, but 
yeah i so i i don't know what i was and i finally uh I was I was always trying to fit in, I guess, and try to figure out a way to make it work. Did that for a long time. Then I finally said, hell, you know what? I'm an atheist. And uh, then I then the program really came to life for me. But unfortunately, it took a couple decades. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I religion wasn't something that was really pressed upon me. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I was baptized Catholic, but uh, my, my grandma would go to Catholic service. But on my dad's side, it was they were they would go to this church where they kind of like sing and dance and speak in tongues i don't know what oh really i don't know what the particular denomination was but it was usually kind of upbeat and i didn't i didn't overly hate going but i didn't get i never feel like i got anything out of it yeah um, yeah and you know i'm just grateful that my my dad was he, he was he's always just been open to to me Letting letting me figure things out on my own or experiencing things on my own. Yeah, and he's in the program. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's cool. uh, I think this year or in 2016, I think will be 29 years. That's great. Yeah. So, what are the meetings like? The agnostic meetings you go to are they pretty big? Um. Well, the, I primarily go to the one on Thursday. Um. And I, the Sunday one's really hard to get to. Mm-hmm. The uh, the Thursday any anywhere from at a minimum usually fifteen up to mm-hmm. thirty thirty five wow you know, d- 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 that's pretty good uh huh we've been meeting for a year in Kansas City and well, actually more than a year now uh, we get between fifteen to twenty some I think the most we've had was twenty five at one time. Mm-hmm. I remember if I, if I ever heard someone having 15 people at a meeting, I think, oh, man, that's a lot of people. But 30, 35, that's, that's really great. Well, and, and it's at the meetings are at um, a big club. We have four or five clubs in, in the Indianapolis metro area. Okay. Um, so they're, they're, it's not necessarily always just people labeled gotcha. agnostics or atheists. You know, sometimes it's just people that need a meeting. You know. See, that's something I've learned. Different cities have the AA is set up a little bit differently because um, I think that St. Louis is somewhat similar to what you're describing in Indianapolis. They have like Alano clubs where you'll have several groups or meetings that will meet in in the club. Mm-hmm. Is that how you have yeah. it set up? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's one in the in the actual town I live in, and you know they hold AA meetings, they hold NA meetings, and you know, yeah, uh, the meetings just pay pays the, the rent to the to the building. See, we don't have anything like that here. I mean our our group one has an Alano club and they have a clubhouse, but that they're the only group that meets there. And most of the groups here in Kansas City have their own place. I mean they they're they're oftentimes in storefronts or their little houses or whatever. Like the my old home group met in a little house that was um, owned by a church. Uh, then you have some groups that meet in, like ours meets meets in a church and church basements and stuff like that. But the, we didn't ha- we don't have the Alano clubs where you have several different meetings or groups going on in one place. And I and I don't want it to to seem as if those were the those are or were the only meetings that I went to. Sure. Um, you know I I hit I, I I definitely spent in those early days and even today like I I still spend plenty of time in not. Um, mm-hmm. non-agnostic atheist meetings. Do you do okay in those meetings? Um, most of the time, most of the time. There's, there's, there's on, on occasion, you know, a particular topic might come up and people start spouting off about things that just make me roll my eyes so hard that I feel like I'm going to knock myself out of my chair. But, you know, the thing that's different today from the past is that I'm at least willing to, I'm able to sit there and see yeah. what maybe I could get out of it, or I can say, okay, this is what's helping this person stay sober. You know, yeah, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's nonsense, you know. But you know, this is helping them, and that's what's helped yeah. me a great deal with the Lord's the Lord's Prayer. Right. Because I was probably a week a week in, maybe two weeks into everything, and I looked up online, you know, some things about it, and you know, people's reactions to it. And I read a comment about uh, how someone, you know, he was an agnostic or atheist, how he dealt with it. He said he looked up, he looked around the room, and he'd see how much good it was doing for other people. Yeah. And thought to himself, who am I to be the selfish jerk to make stink about this when it's helping so many people around me? Yeah. 
So that's kind of what I do. And then I might look around and see if there's anybody else not saying it. Um, mm -hmm. We have a thing in our area where there's this, um, this, this, um, retreat that we go to and they say we've we've spent enough time with our heads down keep your head up and then uh -huh. just like we'll nod to each other um because you know we went to that retreat and spent that time together okay so do, are you comfortable in those meetings just being honest and, and sharing your your view of the program and how you experience it yeah absolutely that's that's a that's a key part of you know as of as what i see as my 12 step you know is carrying that message that's uh, a non-believer, a non-traditional belief system, you know, whatever it is, however you want to label it, can make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crucial because you don't get too much pushback. No, you know, every once in a while, here and there, someone will slide me a note about God, or oh, really? you know, someone might say, "Well, my, you know, higher power is Jesus or is God." Yeah, and I'm like, okay, and. I know it's, it's really the very minority. It's a small minority of people that are like that. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. most of AA is so tolerant. Most people I don't even think are really all that religious, but it's just those few that, that make it hard for a lot of people, but they're, they're, they're much, they're a small minority of people. Yeah, I feel like that's such an important thing to do. And, and, and I keep it respectful, of course, you know, sure. depending on what the topic is, if the topic is something to do with higher power or God or whatever, uh -huh then yes, I'm absolutely going to reference the fact I'm an atheist in the program. I've, yeah. But if it's a non, if it's just, you know, just talking about sure, like tradition three or like, you know, uh -huh. like, I don't know, something, you know, talking about making amends or whatever. Right. You know, like it's, it's not really even necessary to, to talk about. That's right. There's a lot in the program. It's just, just practical stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with the, with any kind of a, belief in anything yeah and, and i and i do it for that newcomer that might be coming in that yeah. is like terrified of like i uh, can't do this i can't do this with the god stuff and mm -hmm. you know so i i always want to make sure that you know i i put it out there and present it to people yeah i'm i'm definitely very open about it um so it sounds like you actually go through the steps you you i, I do too i believe in the steps i like the steps mm -hmm. do, do you yeah yeah i've I, I thoroughly worked through them um, right out of treatment. I, I got uh -huh. a sponsor and, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those crazy things. I, I, I was in IOP at a counselor that said, Hey, you got to go to meetings. She said, go to this particular meeting. And they, that's the, the goal is to find sponsors there. And, um, I, I can be really lazy. <laughs> you know, I, mm -hmm. I can, uh, I can, uh, go out of my way to be lazy sometimes. And, oh, me too. <laughs> um, I love convenience. And this, uh -huh. I went to this meeting. I, I happened to sit next to this gentleman that raised his hand when he said, you know, when they asked, if, would you be willing to sponsor? And raised my hand when, you know, said looking for a sponsor. And I actually, I, I have a, a, a 42, um, the number 42 tattooed on my, my forearm mm -hmm. um, in reference to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. Um, answer to life, the universe, and everything. And uh, okay. he has a twenty. He had he had a twenty four on his wrist. And huh. I was like, that's. I was like, oh, that's close enough. He's sitting right next to me. I'm. A, I'm going to ask him because uh, that's mm -hmm. just how I operate. It, it was really convenient. And uh, come to find out, he's agnostic. Like mm -hmm. it was just. It couldn't have worked out any better. Um, started working through with him. Probably. Three, four months in, I joined up uh, into a workshop, and um, there was another gentleman for just a couple years younger than me, um, also agnostic, atheist, open-minded, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to figure out all this stuff. And the, the combination of those two were crucial, working it with my step or with my sponsor and then uh, through the workshop. And, and learn. What's a workshop? Tell me about that. Um that that particular one was working the working the twelve steps with a group um, through the through the twelve and twelve. Oh, okay. Um, so it's kind of like a study where, where it's like a meeting that's specifically designed for going through the twelve by twelve. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. And, and you'll do you do one step at a time, and you don't move forward until everyone feels ready. Huh. Um, so yeah, you know, um, it's it's a really good opportunity for new newcomers. 
Um, I, I sat in it for uh, the first month this year, but my work schedule yeah. changed. And in the first the first meeting, it went from someone with 60 days to someone with, it was like 27, 28 years. Wow. So, and there was 30 guys in there. Or so pretty, pretty wide gamut, you know, of, yeah. of, of experience. Um, you know, I used to like the 12 and 12 and I used to go to a meeting that a 12 and 12 meeting, uh, I, we used to, well, we used to go to a lot of them back in the old days, but, um, I don't like it anymore, yeah. <laughs> but I used to, I used to like it. I, and one of these days I'll like it again. There's a lot yeah. of good stuff in there. Uh-huh. There really right. is. I, I, the one thing I liked about the 12 and 12 is that it, it went deeper mm-hmm. than the big book on a real psychological level. He really touched touches us emotionally and psychologically in that book. Yeah. And I like that part of it. Yeah, and my sponsor always uses the line, and I've, you know, you've heard it before. More will be revealed, and yeah, you know, it's been revealed to me that Bill was in a very dark place when he wrote that book. And yes, yeah. you're right, he was. He was going through a serious depression at that yes, time, and it, it comes out very much. It so. does, doesn't it? It's, I never really thought about that, but it really does. It's it's almost Old Testament style in some of the some of the approaches and, and, and areas of it, and. Yeah. And a lot of condescension, you know, when he, yeah, that when he talks about religion in that book, he gets it all wrong, but he, and atheism, he talk, he gets it all wrong, but other stuff he gets right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like there's stuff that is really important to me when you read step one, talking about those 10 or 15 literal years, you know, those years of literal hell we don't have to go through anymore. Like, right. I always, if, if I'm in a meeting and step one is referenced in regards to the 12 and 12, I always, you know, I'll thank the, the, the older folks that are there, you know, and tell them, hey, yeah. thanks for doing that extra 10 or 15 years for me. Like that, that stands out as something that is vital to me out of that book. Absolutely. You know, I, I came in pretty young too. I was 25 when I came to my first meeting, been sober since then. And I didn't really feel young though <laughs> at the time but um i i couldn't um, i can't imagine going through another 5 10 15 20 years of drinking um good you know that's just i just can't imagine it was bad enough as it was at the time i don't i don't see how i possibly could have survived i was 29 about to be 30 when i went into treatment i turned 30 yep. a few weeks after treatment and i i, I kind of use the analogy um, or metaphor i don't know um of playing Russian roulette. Yeah. Like I pulled that trigger so many times and it didn't go off. Yeah. I feel like this is my one chance. Um, you know, thankfully in these two and a half years, I, you know, haven't had a relapse. Um, I've taken a great deal of the suggestions, not all of them, but mm-hmm. a lot, you know, compared to, it's, it's definitely one of those progress, not perfection things. You know, I, I hated the cliche so freaking much when I first started. Yeah. But um, progress is definitely the fact that I can figure out a big way to make it work rather than just shutting it all out. Right. Yep. I, I agree with you on that. So do, are there um, are there a lot of younger people coming into the program that you see in, in the meetings over there? It, it kind of depends. Um we actually have some young people's meetings. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, it's a, there's a group called like Inky Paw. Um, mm-hmm. It's like for you know younger younger guys and girls mm-hmm. get, getting into the program. So a lot of them will, will, will tend to maybe hit those first. Yeah. And then yeah, there's there's. A- I guess that's about as how it is over here. We have some groups that where, where younger people are probably more attracted. We're starting to pick up more younger people at our group. Where, um, where we see you know the young the. the, the biggest influx are addicts people that will self-identify as addicts in meetings that's mm-hmm. where there's a lot of young a lot of youth um yeah and yep. that's just because of this terrible terrible heroin epidemic that's, that's damn that's, are you experiencing that in uh, indianapolis yeah yeah that that treatment center that i referenced i actually i work there now um mm-hmm. and I, I work on our it's called odyssey unit it's young adults and mm-hmm. 19 through 23 and Ninety percent are are addicted to heroin. And it's, wow! It's so you know, it I, it might be going on here, and I don't even know it. But um, I remember reading. I think Vermont had a really bad problem with heroin, and I guess it's just spread all over the country, yeah, hasn't it? it? It is, and you know, we we preach, you know, that that idea of you know looking for the similarities, and not mm-hmm. pieces, but these guys will lose things in six months to a year that took us yep. five to 10 years. 
you know. God. It's, it's just incredible. Yep. So that, you know. What is it? Is it because heroin is so inexpensive? What is it? How? Why is heroin so popular now? I don't. I don't get well, it. Well, what's what's happening with a lot of these guys is um, maybe sports injuries or you know some kind of injury leads them to be introduced to Vicodin. What uh-huh. up, you know, whatever, and um, they either get hooked on them that way, or it starts as just experimenting, get hooked on Vicodin, and then you step up to oxys, whatever, you know, yeah, stronger and stronger and stronger, so you get to the point where you're spending a couple hundred dollars, you're not getting anything out of it, somebody will introduce them to heroin and say, hey, this is the same thing, it's way cheaper, and then the guys will start out by snorting it or smoking it, and then all of a sudden they're injecting it, and then that's when it's, it's game over. That's when they Damn. lose everything. They, you know, are stealing out of Walmarts, you know, out of, out of Kroger, you know, whatever. And whatever it takes, stealing, breaking into cars, whatever it takes. And it's it's just so sad to see, you know, yeah, the age of these guys. And a lot of them are convicted felons, you know, that are going to be, that are felons for the rest of their life. And they're only Damn. 19, 20 years old. We're, our, man, our system is so broken. It's, it's you know, they're, they're, once you're a felon, you can't, it's hard to ever get another job. You know, it's like, you know, you see people come out of prison and they're trying to get their life together and no one is going to give them a chance. And they get in prison in the first place because of drugs or alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's cool being kind of on the, the front lines of, of this thing and, and giving mm-hmm. back in, in a way that's so meaningful. Um, so do you work as a counselor? Um, I'm, I'm a step below. I don't have the, the fancy paperwork yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, I'm, um, I'm considered it uh, called a recovery coach. So I'm, I actually am going to be starting that role here at the end of this month, I think, maybe the beginning of the year. And I'm going to be switching that's over cool. to working with adolescents. So I'm uh-huh. going to be working with 13 to 18, 19 year olds. Well, good for you. That's good. That, that's, that must be rewarding. It is. And it's, it's a constant reminder every day, you know, five days out of the week, I'm spending eight hours surrounded by what I don't want to become again. Yeah. You know, and it was stressed to me from the beginning, like, this isn't your program. These aren't your sponsees, you know, mm-hmm. but share your knowledge, share your experiences. Mm-hmm. And that does uh, happen on occasion where someone is really struggling and we're supposed to be careful about how much we, you know, give out personal, personally. Mm-hmm. But on occasion, like I'll tell a guy like, hey, I am an atheist, you know, mm-hmm. I am openly secular and I have found a way to make this program work. Mm-hmm. So there's been more than one guy that I've printed off the agnostic 12 steps for pointed, cool. pointed them in the direction of AA agnostica and been like, Hey, like here are resources. Like you can make this work. Awesome. That's cool. That's, that's, that's really neat to hear. We, we probably need to do our group should try to reach out more to treatment centers around here. Uh, so that at least they know about us, because there's a lot of people in treatment that would love to know about, uh, you know, a secular alternative in AA, mm-hmm. but just don't know about it. Yeah. So, and uh, you, you referenced the, the age. Like, there's, I, I spend a lot of time in meetings in suburbs of Indianapolis. Um, I live on the, the north side of uh, of Indianapolis in a, in a suburb. And so I spend a lot of time in meetings where I'm the youngest or close to the youngest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I turned, I just turned 33 this year and I'm still mm-hmm. in a lot of meetings where I'm, you know, one of the youngest guys I'm surrounded by a lot of 40, 50, 60 year olds. And yeah, that, to me, that's been helpful. Um, the young, the younger meetings tend to be a little more chaotic. Um, uh-huh. People tend to kind of come in and out. And yeah. Come 15 minutes late, leave five minutes early, and it's just really distracting. So yeah. I need to be around people that are focused and, and you know, really giving this a legitimate chance. When I was starting out at my old home group uh, back in '88, there were a lot of us that were in our 20s that were starting off, and um, our group was growing for like the first several years. I guess that I was uh, going to meetings there, and, and we were attracting other people that were coming in. But at, at a certain point, that that group stopped growing, and we were all growing old together. And next thing you know, you look around, we're all middle aged, <laughs> and there's like a one 20 year old in the room or whatever, you right. know. So that's just a sign that that group wasn't doing too well. Um, you know, I think groups need to 
you know, you gotta ha- you gotta have a steady stream of new people that are that are you know you gotta be reaching out and helping people. Yeah, and I and, and I, I mentioned that workshop that I that, that I spent time in. I'm actually right now in the middle of doing a a, tw- a, a workshop um, that's sponsored by the We Agnostics meeting, and hmm. um, it's a bunch of guys from that group, guys and girls, and um, we're working, we're we're doing the steps from a secular perspective. Well, isn't that cool? Yeah, so that that's been really cool. We only meet once a we, we meet once a month, and then we do you know we have about a two hour session and talk about our experiences with how we've made it work. And there's people in there a couple of months to people with years. So that's well, that's neat. Yeah. So you guys are actually putting on a workshop where other, where people from other groups can go and uh, everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it was well, we we closed it off after step two, maybe step three. Uh huh. Because it just it gets hard when you don't close close it off. Because then people come in and out, or somebody comes in and you know they they're they're behind or whatever. And right. It's just easier to, to just say like, hey, we're gonna close it after this period of time, and then you really get to know that that particular group of, of individuals. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's just it's it's so awesome that 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 exists. It's so awesome that things like this podcast exist. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast has been kind of fun. I'm I'm getting a little bit better with the quality and so forth of it, and it's it's kind of odd. I'm I'm to be honest with you, I'm really quite the introvert. And if I was at a party somewhere, um, having small talk with somebody is like my least favorite thing to do. And and here I am on a on a <laughs> doing these podcasts with people, but I enjoy it. I, I love talking to people, especially. It's I guess it's a lot easier when talking to someone in the program. Right, right. It's that small talk thing. Yes, I'm extremely yeah. extremely introverted as well, painfully introverted sometimes and that can be a challenge in meetings sometimes I oh yeah and, and you know i'm also thinking yeah uh, this is a lot different when the, the crap that I, I it's the it's the cocktail party at oh, work that i hate more than anything else in the world but uh yeah this is i love talking to people in the program i could just do this forever yeah i'm way better at this than you know that stuff because we already have that common ground you know yeah we can just start yep. from there and then it goes into wherever it goes because that's what I always have a problem with is finding common ground with people. Because um, mm-hmm. I don't like that small talk. You know, I, I want to talk about things that have some depth. You know, I want to yeah. I want to talk about you know all the craziness that's going on in my head. <laughs> yeah, people tend to not want to do that. Well, it's kind of fun talking to somebody from the indie indie group because I I uh, I've always heard about you know I know about the Indianapolis group. Um, I you know I I know I've got we have seen I've seen your website and. I've uh, met people online from the Indianapolis group and actually a friend of mine, actually the guy who helped start our meeting here in Kansas city just moved to Indianapolis and he goes to that group now. Oh, okay. Jim is his name. Jim. Sounds familiar. C Jim C. He moved from Kansas city. Wow. Yeah. I definitely have. He's an older guy. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, reference this next time I uh, go there. Meet- yeah, he's pretty cool. He uh, he's in his uh, I guess seventies. He he's a retired professor from the college, uh, but I've known him for a long, long, long time, like for twenty years or whatever, uh, and uh, probably longer than that. But uh, he was the only atheist I knew in the program, and I and when I finally couldn't take any more of the of the stuff in the meetings, I I went up to him, told him about these agnostic meetings, asked him if he'd like to do one. He said, "Oh yeah, sure." Next thing you know, we're doing this meeting together. Yeah. But yeah, he's in Indianapolis now. Yeah, and that's that's something that is definitely something I would like to do is is to start a meeting and you know if uh, at that there's a club like I said there's a club in the city that I live in and you know I've been talking to an, a, another individual in the program that mm-hmm. she's she's ready to get get it going so the, the need is there I think. Yeah, uh, you should do it. It's the it's been the best experience of my life, I think, is starting helping start an AA group. And every once in a while, I'll just sit back and just watch people enjoy the meeting or get better in the meeting or, or, or express some gratitude about their recovery. And it's like it's very satisfying. It's, it's amazing. It's like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah, this is what I say. This is what it's really all about. Yeah, that, that makes me think about something that I feel like is missing from my program um, is working with others. I, I don't yeah. I really don't have any sponsees and some of it is definitely work related. Um, yeah. but I think some of it too is, is the belief system or lack thereof, you know? Um, yeah. Cause I think some, that, that turns some people off, but you know, I guess I just don't actively seek it maybe, 
you know, I'm just kind of waiting and it'll be my turn when it is, you know, I've never been much on sponsoring people. I, I, I think for, for whatever reason, a lot of people wouldn't ask me to be, be their sponsor. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, now I do sponsor quite a few people, but I'm not a very good sponsor. <laughs> uh, I'm not real good at talking on the phone and that type of thing. Um, and nowadays, you know, I, I, I guess it was easier for me to sponsor back when I was more of a hardcore AA guy where I was really rigid about how you do the steps and I would take people through and underline and highlight the book like people did with me. But now it's like, I'm like, yeah, you know, do the steps or don't do the steps, whatever you want. You know, Um, the main thing is don't drink and go to meetings. And That's how my sponsor is. That's how my sponsor taught me. He's real hands off. He is, he is not a big book thumper. Uh, He cannot quote lines out of the book. You know, and that's what I needed. I, needed, yeah. you know, some guys need that hard ass that's on top right. of them. You know, that's, that's not what I needed. I needed that little more gentle experience. Yeah. I was so yeah. hesitant to, to jump in. And I yeah. have worked with guys before and, and that is definitely my approach. You know, like, um, we can work these steps. We can not, you can, yeah. I mean, you can not, it's your program, you know? Yep. And that's that's something that's been really cool for me to do is figure out what my program looks. Like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's that was key to me is uh, that there's one line in we in the chapter of the agnostics that 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 is a good line. It says, "Don't don't let your prejudice of religious terms deter you from asking yourself what they honestly mean to you." And I and now of course they were trying to convince us to become um, religious, but I I turned that around and said, "Yeah." I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask myself, what did these things mean to me? So I, I, that means that gives me the freedom to interpret this and, and tell myself, you know, this is my interpretation of the steps. And I did that. I wrote them all out for myself, and uh, that's what makes the program work for me. Um, you know, I think everybody should do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, today I, I have to I have to keep things really really simple uh, because I drove myself insane in those early days trying to be overly analytical. With, with the steps, yep. you know, I've, I've been able to, to just really narrow it down, you know, one, one's pretty easy, you know, two and three, I'm just, you know, I've figured out that there is something that can help and that I'm just making a decision to keep moving, you yep. know, and then we get to four and five and, you know, it that was, that was a really important period when I wrote, wrote down step four and then shared it, um, with my sponsor, I had that first feeling of serenity and peace that I kept hearing about. Mm-hmm. The hamster wheel stopped, you know, because mm-hmm. he said, you know, take an hour, which, you know, he, he had something he did take from the book was, you know, talking about mm-hmm. taking an hour, just thinking about your experience and then just let me know. And I said, I didn't think for an hour, which, you know, is not how I normally operate. Right. Um, so I've had, I've had really good experiences over the last two and a half years and it's because i changed yeah. AA did change you know uh, right the world has the world has changed a little bit but it's it's me we did. it's me that's changed it's my perspectives yeah well weston this has been really nice I, I thank you again so much for agreeing to do this um it was great talking to you it sounds like uh, indianapolis has a really thriving aa community out there i'm gonna have to get out there and oh. visit my friend and go to those groups sometime we are, we are so lucky out here i mean there's upwards of 500 meetings in the indianapolis metro area cool it's, it's just awesome okay all right well thanks again man i appreciate it Well, that's another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be talking to you very soon. But until then, take care and be well.